Hey, buddy, you all right? The voice, a man's voice, dragged him out of the shallow sleep into which he had finally drifted after hours of visionary semi-consciousness. He heard an idling motor, smelt the exhaust, felt the progress the cold had made into his flesh while he had been asleep and unable to beat it back by shivering, the paroxysms of shivering that you learn to half surrender yourself to, half induce on your first winter nights, which for him had been decades ago. The scarf over his face was solid with ice. His clothes, shirts, sweaters, pants, massive winter coat were drained of body heat, a thick, chilling shroud against his flesh. Despite his undershorts clinging closeness, his dick, frighteningly cold and alien, was shrunk to an infantile smallness, his balls drawn deep into his inner groin. His fingers and feet were numb, that terrifying, heavy, dead numbness that you woke up to on the coldest nights, if you woke up. He clenched his body, searching for the shiver, the life response that had retreated far down towards the center. I'm all right, he answered, forcing himself to sound as hale and present as possible, opening his eyes on the shop front door. He knew it was the cops, that tone of cheerful, subliminally menacing authority, car, the fact that there was an extreme cold weather alert. He began to stir out of his fetal position, drew his mittened hands out from between his legs, pressed himself up on his cardboard mattress, moving with deliberate, demonstrative, step-by-step -step slowness, turned himself around to sit up on the storefront's shallow step. Lowering his scarf from his face, he looked up, two of them, as he had known to expect, a tall, massive, bearded young Sikh, he had instantly recognized the slight trace of an accent, wearing the special blue turban with the crest of the Metropolitan Toronto Police, and a young black woman, notably short, terribly cute, he thought, who stood behind, near the car, with a smile clouded by serious concern. He smiled at her first, suppressing the attack of shuddering that finally arose from deep within, and that he would have welcomed if he had woken up alone. Cold night to be sleeping out, said the Sikh, his breath clouding densely before his mouth. You know there's a cold weather alert tonight. It's going down to minus 40. I didn't know that, actually, he replied. It felt like just another night. I'm used to it. You want us to take you to a shelter, said the cop. We're strongly urging people to go to shelters tonight. No, I, I'd really prefer to stay out, he said. I know what I'm doing. I'm a veteran. He could see the cop deliberating before finally turning and looking questioningly at his colleague, who replied with a resigned nod, no longer smiling. Okay, said the cop, turning back to him, sounding a little defeated. We're going to let you stay, if you insist. But if it gets too cold for you, the nearest shelter is at the Scott Mission. He nodded, smiling. Right, he said. I know the Scott. He paused. Daniwad, he said. The cop stared at him, startled, confused, smiled uncomfortably, and turned away. He watched the car set off, trailing a bloated cloud of frosted exhaust, glide down Kensington Street, and disappear leftward round the corner at Dundas. At last he surrendered to the fit of shuddering, which now possessed him, shaking his whole body like an electric current, as the life heat that had retreated to his viscera slowly flowed back into his arms, legs, genitals. He could actually hear his teeth chattering. It was unreal, he thought. One year ago, where had he been? On the other side of the planet, in her country, sleeping naked on the floor in the winter night, frigid by local standards, pleasantly warm for a Canadian. And even more recently, only months ago, it had been summer, with draining heat by day and by night, swarms of mosquitoes that banished sleep. Summer, when it would have been early spring here. It had been summer when he left. The fit had now subsided, having accomplished its purpose. Heat stood evenly throughout his body. He thought of getting up and walking around the market for a few minutes to consolidate the gain. Then he would have to hoist on his book-heavy backpack. And there was no need to woo back sleep. 
He was already drifting back down into unconsciousness. His thoughts were already being inflected by the hallucinatory logic of dream. He lay down on his cardboard mattress, from which his body heat had by now dissipated, so that he felt its coldness against his shoulder through his thick layers of clothing. He would sleep well, as well as it was possible to sleep in this deepest cold. He would awaken at twilight to find that the life heat had again retreated into his body's core. Again he would surrender himself to the fit as he walked north to the Scot. Not that he greatly cared whether he made it through the night, but he had not yet reached the point of not caring at all, and that minimal remnant of involvement in life did still make the difference between waking up and sleeping forever. It was a comfort to him, the greatest comfort he had, that after a lifetime of yearning for the power to choose his own freedom, that power had finally come into his hands. He let himself drift, drift down. As he walked, almost stumbled up deserted Kensington Street in the first degree of twilight, fragmentary images from his dreams lingered almost visibly. A dirt road through a mildly hilly countryside that was evidently the rural Karnataka through which he had made his pilgrimage of flight months ago. Her naked hips felt more than seen, the sensation of holding them with both hands, the panicked urgency of imminent sex amid the minefield of their catastrophic history. Her face drifting away into death, this one a memory of a vision, but a vision that had had the effective force of a real event. Her sleeping face suffused the culmination of decades of innocent, uncomprehending disappointment and suffering, the last fading breath wasted on his name, her name for him, Ashu. He gasped as if punched in the gut, tottered under the weight of his knapsack, leaned on an empty wooden produce stand in front of one of the market's few remaining traditional shops. His breath came in voiceless sobs, which projected from his mouth in spikes of frost and grew shorter and shorter until he felt ready to push off again. In front of the Scott Mission's about to be opened main doors, he joined the small crowd consisting mainly of the crazy and alcoholic men amongst whom he had been such a prodigy of youth when he had first fallen into this world at sixteen, well more than three decades ago. The world to which he now returned after a failed odyssey that had taken him to the opposite face of the earth and back, a journey so unreally unlikely that no one here could have imagined it, looking at him, and that he sometimes doubted his own sanity, looking about him. In my beginning is my end, in my end is my beginning, he often thought, ironically, hopefully. Many of the hunched, bundled figures held small styrofoam cups of coffee from the night shelter whose entrance was at the end of the building's facade. Most of them would have spent the night there, some in other shelters, and a few, like him, would be hardcore outdoorsmen, people who were insane or reclusive enough that they preferred the risk of death in the sweet solitude of an empty doorway to the certainty of life in the disliked company of human beings. At seven, the doors were opened from inside, and the herd, including some women and youths, shuffled into the chapel where they sat or lay down on the ranged plastic chairs, or, like him, on the floor against the walls. He had still not yet gotten used again to the mission's fecal stench, the inevitable consequence of homelessness in a cold climate, in a culture where people ineffectually wiped their asses with paper instead of washing them with water, which was a norm where he had spent the recently ended last long phase of his life. As he rapidly drifted back down into sleep, he wondered how long the readjustment would take, and if he even had that much time. He awoke to find the chapel packed for the imminent first sitting at ten o'clock, resounding with a murmur of the crowd mingled with the shouted gibberish of the television at the front. Much had changed since he had last eaten here about a quarter century ago. Much of the physical environment had been renovated or replaced, such as the television itself, no longer a heavy block perched on a metal stand, but a light, thin screen set on a table. The whole staff was new, without a single recognizable survivor from that previous age. The current first-in-command was Indian, with what he had immediately recognized as a southern Keralite surname, Abraham, which went with his complexion at the dark end of the Indian spectrum. 
one of the more striking differences was the absence of an organist. Gone was the pleasant old East European dwarf, who in those days used to emerge from the kitchen in his white apron at five minutes to the hour to accompany the men, to use the language of the time, as they shuffled into the dining room with the saints go marching in, and gone even was his instrument, that lumbering old wood-cased electric organ, having been replaced with a sleek black lightweight synthesizer type thing that must be used only on Sundays now, played by God knew who. The complexion of the crowd too was changed. More women, more non-white people, including different types than those that had prevailed back then, apart from the persistent high proportion of natives. At one minute to ten, he saw Mr. Abraham walk through the chapel door and, turning off the television in passing, advanced to the podium at the front, where he spoke a short prayer in his quite strong Malayalam accent. Then an aproned kitchen worker opened the side door, and the rows of seated diners rose and began to file into the dining room in what was for him an eerie, musicless silence. Scratching his shaved head, he sat on the floor against the wall, watching them go in, shepherded by the current bouncer, a burly young black man who had told him he was a Toronto-born Somali, and finally rose to join the stragglers, which had been his practice since the beginning, decades ago. He found himself at the last table, where he as usual abstained from the sweet, milky tea and declined the bowl of bone soup that it was the duty of the end person to ladle out for the table's seven other diners, and instead wolfed down as much of the gummy white bread and margarine as he could, again declining the main course. When the cart of trays arrived at their table, the plates were handed down, since it consisted mainly of meat, and he continued to cling to his veganism, as to the massive volumes he carried around on his back, despite his abandonment of the life of which they had been both causes and effects. Instead, he peeled and ate two of the fairly decent tangerines from a bowl in the table's center, pocketed three more, no one else was touching them, filled a plastic bag with a selection of donated day-old breads and pastries in boxes by the exit, and pushed through the slamming metal side door into the sharp midwinter sunlight. He strolled down Spadina, having realized that today, too, he would not be following the routine that had established itself over the months since he had gotten off the plane, and which had been faltering in the last few days, a routine whose daily core was hours spent on the public lower floors of the university's Robarts Library, only steps away from the mission. Today, of that routine, he would preserve his visit to the Harrison Baths, and then he didn't know. Things were falling apart. He was hopeful that he himself was finally falling apart. Tomorrow he would visit a nearby drop-in center and access his email through one of their computers. On the day of his arrival, he had not followed his father's urgent advice to take a bus straight from the airport to his northern Ontario hometown to stay with him in the family house until he felt ready to begin developing a new life for himself, probably finding some kind of humble work up there. He had unconsciously known that he needed, deserved, the penance and mortification of his old familiar life of destitution on the streets of the metropolis. Maybe that penance was ending. Maybe more than that was ending. He hoped so. At the baths, as he stood in his undershorts before the mirror, shaving his head, he suddenly paused, struck by the cadaverous white deathliness, dramatically deepened since the last time he had noticed. The eyes. He would not avoid them. What was there? The reptilian coldness of which he used to accuse him, which he would so vehemently deny, raging. From deep within their pools, like a little round stone fallen to the bottom, shone a terrible pleading desperation that knew that there was no one to appeal to. Who in the world loved this person anymore? His father, and he could die any day. She, as he had told her again and again that she would, she, freed from the distraction of his presence, would have rapidly, violently awoken from the delusion that had possessed her for fifteen years, seeing him at last for what he was. Nothing. Now nobody cared if he cried at last, too late, as always, always too late. No one would see. He stared at the person on the other side of the glass, with his razor paused at his throat, this hated stranger to whom he was fated to be handcuffed until the end, whom he was fated to be. He could see he was trembling 
on the verge of disintegration, he almost had to feel sorry for him. What have you done, you fool? But he knew that he had done the right thing. Too late, as always, but better late than never. He almost whispered to him, Do the right thing. As he soaked his skeletal limbs under the shower, soaping his undershorts, too, before slipping them off and dropping them against the wall, he wondered how close he might have brought himself by now to the Swachamaranam, the death by wish that he had always longed for. What was the right thing to do now? He was still waiting for a sign from fate, like the one that had driven him to flee Bengaluru, walking north by country roads, almost psychotic with exhaustion and grief, eating in village restaurants under the round-eyed stares of the villagers, sleeping anywhere by the roadside, barely sleeping, devoured by mosquitoes, skirting Pune almost a thousand kilometers to the north, and finally staggering down the mountain, a wild-eyed walking dead man, to Mumbai's urban hellhole and the airport, where they were barely willing to sell him a ticket, a sign for life or death. He walked west on Queen, in the cold, sharp light of early afternoon, his damp undershorts rapidly stiffening and beginning to scrape against his skin. It still felt surreal being back here, amidst this palimpsest world, with his earliest lair going back to his seventeenth year, when he had wandered through its original bohemian grunge alone, and its latest one being no more than two or three years old, when he had brought her this way, pointing out the shattered remnants through the narrowing gaps in the clean, new, gentrified facade. In the early days of his return, a volatile optimism had sometimes fleetingly inspired him with the thought that a new age of his life in this city could be about to begin, which would appear in the geological record as a vigorous, active new layer after a long period of stagnant dormancy. He would just need an initial phase of reorientation and self-consolidation before this beginning, a phase in which he would prepare himself for action through reflection and the penance of destitution. But he seemed to have gotten stuck in reflection and penance. Desire for the new age beyond appeared to have failed. There was no new age beyond, only a vast expanse of time suddenly empty of her. The books on his back were not enough, Though the largest of them contained time enough, a whole eon to be precise, of the cyclic cosmology of his wife's religion. But no, history, religion, literature, ideas, they could not in themselves furnish him with a reason to live. He found himself walking far down Bathurst, over the tracks, under the Gardner Expressway, along Fleet Street, through Coronation Park, to sit on a bench by the concrete lakeshore at a point where the marina ended and a vista of the frozen lake opened, receding into the clear western distance round the Golden Horseshoe's dark industrial coast. They had never been here together. In fact, he had not come this way since before he had abandoned the city, before their fatal meeting. But to his left, across the narrow channel, was the tail end of the island where once, during their first visit, they had lain together on the grass by a small isolated strip of beach clothed and embracing, cooled by the summer wind off the open lake to the south, and he had looked down at her serenely closed-eyed, innocent, still girlish face, and the enormity of their loss had suddenly appeared to him with terrifying clarity and overwhelmed him. The same wind, now iron-cold, assailed him now, and he surrendered to it, arms stretched out on the wooden bench's back, head tipped back, neck offered, allowing it to penetrate him to the heart without raising the shield of tenseness and shivering that kept him alive through the killing nights. He thought again of one of the last verses he had read in the tome on his back. Kalo ganto gatiya mokyo babatam api bharata eta tariyo hi wumani paramo bharata rabha It's time for you two to go the ultimate journey this, I think, is best for you. The ultimate journey, the suicidal great departure, the ice-bound Himalaya of the five Pandava princes and their common wife, Garapati, at the end of a life in which they have seen the destruction and loss of all that is most precious. They went by the sea's northern shore, and to the west they saw the city of gates submerged by the waters. 
they reached the north, and with minds controlled with meditation, they saw the great mountain of snow. He gazed far out, beyond the lake's vast frozen margin, to where the open water shimmered on the horizon. He was dragged out of sleep by the rumble of chairs as the first row rose to go into the dining room. He opened his eyes and looked up at the chapel ceiling from where he lay on the floor against the wall. It would be ten o'clock, the ten o'clock sitting. He would wait until the second sitting at eleven. What was the rush, the rush to eat and replenish life? He could wait an hour at least. He closed his eyes and drifted back down into an exhausted, deep, imageless sleep. Afterwards, he walked along College and down Augusta to a drop-in center, also known from those days, where there were now two computers available for the Internet in a room off the main sitting area. Lunch was being served, so both computers were vacant. He logged into his email account with a vague thought, a hope, a dread of finding an email from her. As always, her name was not there where it might have appeared amid the dwindling latter-day trickle of his once abundant correspondence. Three emails this time from old friends with their kind, sad, meaningless questions about how he was getting on, and one from a name he didn't recognize, with a blank subject field, which he left unopened until he had finished reading the others. He sat staring, heart pounding. He clicked it open. It was late, night. He sat up on the churchyard bench where he had lain throughout the day since leaving the drop-in nearby. Perhaps two hours ago, across the side street, he had heard the century-old fire station's clock tower ring nine o'clock, the last rung hour of the day. His nose, his cheeks, crusted with the residue of frozen tears, his exposed earlobes, his fingers and toes ached with numbness. He swayed a little, faint with hunger, sat back with his arms stretched out on the bench's back. He felt the weight of the morning on his bladder and let it go, felt the heat bathe his crotch and ass, and quickly began to freeze stiff. The shadow of a police car glided down the side street beyond the dark churchyard with its naked trees. Throughout the day, he had drifted in and out of a twilight of memory and dream. The clarity of waking consciousness, he considered again that he now had a house to live in and die in, and money, that both of his only two intimates were now lost to him. Ashu, her name for him, this had been her last word, which he had heard her whisper with her dying breath in the vision he had had of her that morning, a vision of her at the end of a lifetime of misery and disappointment that he would have forced her to share and he had fled as she slept, to save her from this fate, to take back the misery and disappointment as much as possible, and leave her free to recreate herself in the long remainder of her life. Let her last word be someone else's name, or no one's. He lay down again. Aditi, he whispered, and surrendered himself to the cold. <laughs>